Foundation at St. Michael's Hospital and Senior Investigator in the Kina Research Center for Biomedical Science. And he is the founding chair of the International Forum of Acute Clinical Trials, in fact, a global network of 37 investigator-led critical care clinical research groups. Uh, Professor Marshall, he will talk on how will COVID influence and change critical care. Professor Marshall, the floor is yours. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be joining you today, even if it is only virtually and from my home in Toronto, Canada. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of your meeting. Pandemics have been a recurrent part of human history. There are records going back 5,000 years of mass graves in China. Uh, they give voice to the impact that infectious diseases have had upon populations. As you may know, during the Middle Ages, somewhere in the vicinity of a quarter of the population of Europe was wiped out by the bubonic plague. And then in the last century, we were faced with a pandemic that killed somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 50 million people, the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919. Pandemics though have also given rise to advances in medicine and particularly uh, spurred the emergence of intensive care units some um, 60 years ago. It was uh, Bjorn Ibsen who was an anesthesiologist in Copenhagen who during a, Copen uh, during a polio outbreak in 1952 established what is generally recognized as the first intensive care unit in the world. He showed that when you had medical students manually bagging patients who could not breathe because of their polyomyelitis, you could save lives. In doing so, he fundamentally changed the world and he gave birth to the specialty that we all uh, share. The 21st century, of course, has seen its share of pandemics, even though we're only two decades into it, in the early 21st century, there was the SARS pandemic uh, that impacted China, uh, but also affected my home city of uh, Toronto. In 2009, we had the H1N1 influenza pandemic, again, a more international pandemic. We had Zika outbreaks, we had Ebola outbreaks in the last uh, five to 10 years. And then of course, we're now in the middle of a COVID uh, pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2 uh, a coronavirus. It started really quite innocuously. Reports emerged in late uh, 2019 of an unknown viral infection that had uh, been seen in Wuhan in China. But at the time, it sounded like it was something uh, exotic, something contained, and something that was going to be of more uh, academic interest. That was really until early February when it became apparent that not only was China being really quite uh, severely impacted by COVID-19, but it had the potential to become a global pandemic. And it was this natural experiment that really underlined, I think for many of us, what well, the threat we were facing. This was the Diamond Princess of Cruise Boat that uh, houses approximately 2,700, 2,800 uh, people who were traveling in close proximity to each other and isolated from the rest of the world. A passenger got onto the Diamond Princess in Hong Kong uh, and was sick at the time with what later proved to be COVID-19. He was the only person at the time who had COVID-19, but the ship was quarantined and by the time the disease on the ship had run its course. A quarter of the staff and uh, vacationers on the Diamond Princess had been infected with COVID-19. 2% of them had died. And so this told us a couple of very important things. We were dealing with an outbreak of a disease that was highly infectious and also substantially lethal. Uh, the situation has continued to expand and it's not going to come as a surprise to you that we're still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Depending on where you live on the planet, you're either in the third or fourth wave of the uh, outbreak. But here you see the latest data from the WHO uh, showing the course of the pandemic. As of uh, today, roughly 250 million people around the world have been infected by it and uh, 5 million uh, people have died. These numbers are probably underestimates for the true burden of the pandemic. You'll appreciate that data from uh, Africa uh, is really quite limited, uh, although the population of the continent is a billion people. But the disease has certainly had a profound impact, not just on health, but on virtually every aspect of our daily lives. 
So it's hard in the middle of the pandemic to realize how fundamentally uh, the occurrence of this infection is changing the world within which we live and work. And what I'd like to focus on this morning is some thoughts about how COVID-19 is changing critical care from three broad perspectives, critical care research, the provision of clinical care, and the opening of new uh, avenues to global uh, collaboration. In the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, there were approximately 300 clinical trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov. As of today, there are close to 7,000 studies of uh, COVID-19 that have been registered on that website. Uh, more than 100 countries, including uh, many low and middle income uh, countries in Southeast Asia and Africa, are included in the list of sites that are doing studies. And there are close to 200,000 citations in PubMed. We have truly embraced the concept that part of the effective response to a global uh, catastrophe such as COVID-19 is to study it and to generate knowledge as quickly uh, as we possibly can do. And so we've seen large scale and very effective trials uh, emerge during the pandemic. The recovery trial in the United Kingdom is recruiting over 44,000 patients uh, to a randomized controlled trial of multiple different interventions in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. They've shown for example, benefit or corticosteroids. They've shown that antiviral agents are ineffective. Uh, they're currently studying a number of additional agents, including varicitinib, dimethyl fumarate, the optimal dose of corticosteroids, and empagliflozin. Uh, this was the initial report from the uh, recovery trial. It's important to recognize that the protocol was uh, drafted in early March. Writing began around the 9th of March and was concluded by the middle of the month. The first patient was recruited at the end of March, and these data were presented at the WHO meeting on the 16th of June. So a, a interval of only three months to go from an idea to the first data showing effective therapies for COVID-19. And so what recovery reported was that corticosteroids actually reduced mortality and particularly for those patients who were the sickest, those patients receiving mechanical ventilation in ICU. Four months before this, as the pandemic was just emerging, there were multiple opinions about the value of corticosteroids, but it's probably fair to say that the bulk of the opinion was that these were likely to be harmful. And this just underlines how important it is that we study uh, a pandemic, difficult as it is, uh, as it is evolving. I want to say a few words about the REVAMP CAP trial, which uh, I'm involved with. This is a trial that is studying critically ill patients who would be admitted to an intensive care unit. It's being run in multiple countries and multiple continents around the world. Uh, it is focusing on the sixth patients, those who would be uh, managed in an ICU under ideal circumstances. It has recruited close to 8,400 patients with COVID-19 and uh, randomized patients to over 15,000 different uh, uh, randomizations. We're studying in total 50 different in interventions on the Remap cap platform and uh, have uh, begun to generate uh, data on optimal treatment of COVID-19. REMAP-CAP is different from other clinical trials in that it is a platform trial. The platform trial is a trial that studies a disease rather than a single intervention. What that means is that the trial can actually study multiple interventions simultaneously or sequentially. And that's the reason that we're able to study up to 50 different interventions at the same time, all within the context of the same statistical model. We use a Bayesian approach rather than a frequentist approach, and that has some implications for how we draw conclusions, which you'll see in the next few slides. It also impacts the way we randomize patients to the trial. We use a technique called response adaptive randomization, and what this entails is that as the trial learns, it changes the randomization percentages. So patients are more likely to be randomized to those interventions that are doing better at that point in the trial. This both makes the trial more effective, but equally importantly, it means that patients who are recruited to the trial 
are likely to benefit as a result of their uh, enrollment in it. A platform trial also has the potential to be a perpetual trial. Typically it's funded by multiple different funders, but as one intervention is studied and a conclusion is reached, other uh, interventions can be studied and the results can be immediately applied to other patients who are in the trial. This just shows schematically how a platform trial works. Uh, you start with a cohort of patients with the disease. In our case, this is patients with COVID-19 who have organ dysfunction, either respiratory or cardiovascular. They can be randomized at the uh, choice of the clinician and the patient and family to a number of different domains, and within those domains, to interventions uh, that are under study. So you can see in this uh, hypothetical example, we're starting with a single domain that has three different interventions in it. Uh, patients are being randomized one-to-one -one at the start of the trial, but as the trial learns, uh, the number of patients who are randomized to the better performing interventions increases. Once you've reached a conclusion, as has happened here in the case of intervention C, we can add another intervention, in this case, intervention E. But equally, and this is one of the real strengths of a platform design during a pandemic, is that as more is learned about the disease that you're studying, you can add new interventions that you may not have considered at the time the trial was originally launched. So here are some of the data that uh, REMAP-CAP has generated. Our first report was last year uh, when we reported on the efficacy of hydrocortisone uh, in patients with uh, severe COVID-19. And our results replicated those of the solidarity trial in a smaller number of patients. We showed that patients who were receiving uh, hydrocortisone either for the duration of the shock or for fixed dose did better than patients who uh, received no hydrocortisone. In these heat maps that you'll see in subsequent slides, red is bad, blue is good. Our endpoint is the number of days alive and free of organ support over 21. So if you have a lot of blue, you have more days alive and free of organ support. If you die, uh, you get minus one and are shown in dark red on the graph. So we're looking for less red, more blue, uh, and we can analyze those uh, statistically. We can also show these as a kind of survival curve, and in this case, it is the lower bar that is the one that is uh, doing better. We've also reported on tocilizumab and cerilumab, which are two antagonists to the interleukin-6 receptor. Uh, our data show that either agent improves survival and shortens the duration of organ support in patients with severe COVID-19. Here you see pooled data for uh, interleukin-6 receptor antagonists versus control. And these data were reported uh, earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. We've also looked at antiviral agents in the sickest of patients, and our data uh, essentially mirror what's been seen in less uh, severely ill patients. Patients who are doing best here are those patients who are actually randomized to the control arm. They are the ones that seem to have the largest amount of blue, although patients who are receiving lopinavir, ritonavir alone uh, also are roughly the same. Uh, patients receiving uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, do worse, and the combination of hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir, ritonavir uh, is associated with the, a result which is significantly worse uh, than not receiving any antiviral therapy. So I think we were able to demonstrate that uh, although at the beginning of the pandemic there was a clamor to put patients on hydroxychloroquine and lapidavir or tonavir, uh, this was a bad idea and these particular agents actually uh, worsen the outcome rather than help patients. We've studied uh, convalescent plasma. These data were just published about a week ago uh, in JAMA and we found no signal of benefit for treatment with convalescent plasma in patients with severe COVID-19. We studied therapeutic anticoagulation, and this was uh, an addition to the platform as it became apparent that thrombosis was a common complication in this viral infection. And here we found divergent results. Patients who were not critically ill uh, with COVID-19 actually benefited from full-dose therapeutic anticoagulation whereas patients who were critically ill in an intensive care unit showed no signal uh, for benefit. 
So, so far, REMAP-CAP has uh, studied, completed, and reported a number of uh, different interventions. I've described our findings for antiviral agents, for hydrocortisone, for IL-6 receptor antagonism. We've also looked at uh, anakinra, the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, and found no evidence of benefit for that. We've shown benefit for heparin in the moderate state, but not the severe state. No effect for convalescent plasma. And coming out very shortly are our results on aspirin and uh, P2Y12 inhibitors, which show no significant effect uh, for the overall uh, endpoint of the trial, but some intriguing subgroup uh, analyses. Now, it's not just randomized clinical trials that have uh, exploded during the COVID-19 pandemic. Observational research has uh, benefited from large, very large studies of patients hospitalized with COVID-19. The poster child for this is uh, led by Isaric in the United Kingdom. They have recorded data on more than 400,000 patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. The reports are only beginning to emerge and this will be a rich, rich source of understanding of critical illness and uh, viral infections in hospitalized patients. But even at this stage, you can see uh, global patterns of practice. Uh, antibacterial agents being quite widely used, up to about two thirds of patients receiving them. Corticosteroids being used in about half of patients. Antiviral agents, not so much. And other um, uh, agents that might be used to treat uh, COVID-19 being less frequently uh, employed. There's also been some spectacular basic science work that has been proceeding at a remarkable pace uh, thanks to integration between uh, clinical databases and uh, large-scale basic science uh, biobanks that have been able to collect uh, uh, specimens from patients with COVID-19. This was a beautiful paper that just appeared in the last uh, week or two in science, uh, which is looking at the role of interferons in uh, COVID-19, and in particular, identifying a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, in a gene called OAS1 uh, that is protective in patients with uh, COVID-19. So this is establishing a very strong biological basis for additional specific therapy for uh, COVID-19. How are we doing? Well, this may be a little bit simplistic, but if this is a nice graphic representation of what's happened in research uh, over the last 18 months of COVID-19. It took us over three millennia to uh, eradicate smallpox, same length of time for polio, cholera, two and a half millennia, measles, one and a half, even contemporary diseases such as HIV, AIDS, and Ebola, effective therapies have really only emerged uh, in a time frame that's measured in years. COVID-19, we had data from human trials within three to four months of the onset of the pandemic. We're still continuing to uh, gather these, and there's going to be a very uh, rich uh, legacy of new science emerging from the uh, pandemic. COVID-19 has also changed clinical care. It has shown us what is possible and it has really brought the ICU to the forefront of the public health response to a pandemic infection. In China, uh, when the outbreak uh, exploded in Wuhan, a whole new hospital was built in a matter of 10 days. Basically all of the hospital was dedicated to COVID-19 patients and critically ill COVID-19 patients. The tent shown in the upper right-hand corner is from a Canadian hospital uh, that outfitted tents that could manage ventilators in the parking lots in preparation for an onslaught of patients. We've all learned how to do much more with relatively limited resources, even though these resources have been challenged uh, and sometimes uh, to the breaking point. But we've also learned the limits of what we can do, and there's a growing feeling that we need to rethink uh, the uh, ease with which we have implemented interventions such as intubation and mechanical ventilation. A shortage of ventilators is a big factor behind looking at alternatives to mechanical ventilation, uh, such as helmet ventilation or such as prone uh, ventilation, which can be provided to any spontaneously breathing patient.
So again, it's early days, but I think one of the legacies of the COVID-19 pandemic will be a very different perspective on uh, the benefits and harms associated with mechanical ventilation. We've also learned a lot about the potential of old drugs that we've used uh, for anti-inflammatory activity or used in other diseases to treat an infectious disease. And the promise here for future treatment of sepsis patients, I think, is, is substantial. We've learned, for example, what corticosteroids and heparin can be efficacious. There are ongoing studies to determine the utility of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitors such as clopidogrel and statins. Uh, we will have answers on those within the next uh, several months, uh, and it will be interesting to see if we can add these inexpensive agents to the armamentarium of treatments for COVID-19. We've also learned that there's a substantial amount to be learned from other specialties. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis in particular, therapies that are widely used in patients with arthritis, such as the IL-6 receptor antagonists or inhibitors of Janus kinases, such as baricitinib, are showing efficacy in the treatment of COVID-19. And this opens the door to new therapies for critically ill patients. I do think that one of the key messages that is coming uh, from what we're learning so far is that the benefit in treating the disease is not in specifically targeting the virus with antiviral therapies, but in targeting the maladaptive consequences of the host response with a variety of biologic response modifiers, which may be anticoagulants, may be anti-inflammatory drugs, or maybe agents whose function we don't fully uh, understand. Clinical care is also changing in that governments and decision makers are understanding the importance of research, planning, and central organization in the provision of healthcare. The model for this has been the NIHR in the United Kingdom, where in the past, hospitals have been funded to do research, uh, and the research can be coordinated centrally. Uh, targets are established for recruitment to trials in exchange for funding for research coordinators and the necessary uh, infrastructure to conduct clinical trials. What this meant in the COVID-19 pandemic was that at the start of the pandemic, uh, priorities were established. Uh, certain trials were, uh, were targeted as trials that should be recruited to for patients with COVID-19, and that included the recovery trial, principal trial for patients pre-hospital, and pre-MAP cap for those patients in the intensive care unit. Uh, different agents in different phases of the disease were prioritized, and as a result of that, the United Kingdom has really been at the forefront of identifying effective therapies for uh, COVID-19. You can see here some of the differing uh, interventions that have been or are being studied in the United Kingdom right now. But even there, I think there's been an awareness that although this is a substantial step forward uh, beyond what most of the rest of the world has been able to supply, there's still a long way to go. Uh, only about 7% of all patients admitted to hospital for COVID-19 were recruited to clinical trials, and about 20% of uh, all patients admitted to intensive care units. Just for some comparison, in Canada, we've only been able to recruit about 25 to 3% of patients admitted to intensive care units to rebound cap in Canada. So uh, we have a much, much longer way to go uh, here. Finally, uh, COVID-19 is really changing the way we think about research, the way we think about collaboration, and is underlining the fact that we are all intimately interconnected on this small and vulnerable planet. Here you see recruitment uh, from Remap Cap. We are recruiting from multiple sites around the world, and at present, most of our cases are coming from Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Uh, but we're also getting cases from Southeast Asia, from uh, Pakistan, India, uh, and Nepal. We have recruitments from Canada uh, and the European Union. We've just recently opened sites in Japan and South America, and we anticipate very shortly uh, opening our first site in uh, Africa, in South Africa. The WHO Solidarity Trial uh, launched at the start of the pandemic 
Uh, similarly, it's recruiting broadly around the world. It has uh, 52 different countries that are uh, providing patients to the trial, 600 hospitals. Uh, it is a study across the spectrum of severity of disease, but with a greater emphasis on less severe disease. They are now up over 15,000 patients. They have been studying uh, more the effect efficacy of antiviral agents uh, and showed that uh, hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir or ritonavir uh, were not effective. But they're currently studying biological response modifiers, particularly uh, imatinib and infliximab. So a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic has been a recognition that we have to respond at scale to a global pandemic. And large research consortia, such as REMAP-CAT, such as uh, uh, the Solidarity Trial, uh, such as the Active 2 initiative in the United States, are becoming the norm. They're using differing designs. Most of them are some variant on a platform trial design, uh, whether it's done using a Bayesian approach or a frequentist approach. But we're clearly seeing the benefits for integrating uh, research into clinical care using the platform trial model. We're also seeing collaboration amongst platform trials. Uh, the uh, data from remap cap that I showed you on uh, heparin in moderate disease is actually a collaboration between three separate platform trials, ATTACK, uh, remap cap and the ACTIVE-4 trial uh, that's led by the uh, NIH. This enabled the recruitment of uh, 3,000 patients in the space of less than half a year and uh, the demonstration of a very important effect that anticoagulation is beneficial in patients who have uh, moderate uh, disease. The World Health Organization has played an important role in uh, coordinating and promoting new models of uh, research. Um, I have to uh, declare that I am uh, the co-chair of the committee of the World Health Organization, but our committee has been given quite a free reign in developing new models of research collaboration. And one of the things that we have developed is a model called the prospective meta-analysis. The idea behind this is that during a pandemic, many people are studying similar uh, interventions in the same disease, and we want to get answers as rapidly as possible. Therefore, there's an argument for sharing data even before any individual trial has reached its full conclusion. And so we've been doing this, we reported uh, a prospective meta-analysis of interventions for corticosteroids in September of last year that pulled data from recovery. Uh, remap cap was published in that same issue of uh, JAMA, also showed benefit for uh, corticosteroids. But the beauty of this prospective meta-analysis model is several things. First of all, we have a much more international picture of the efficacy of corticosteroids, not simply in the United Kingdom. We have trials here from uh, Brazil, uh, from Europe, and really from around the world uh, with remap cap. Secondly, we're able to show that the effect of corticosteroids is a class effect and not a specific effect of dexamethasone. You can see that dexamethasone is efficacious, but the same magnitude of signal although there are a fewer number of patients is seen uh, when patients receive uh, hydrocortisone. And this is important uh, in a setting where there may be millions or tens of millions of people who need treatment and drug shortages are uh, threatened. Uh, these are data from uh, our recent meta-analysis looking at IL-6 receptor antagonism. We were able to uh, uh, convince uh, investigators from trials that recruited something like 85% of all patients randomized to IL-6 therapies, about 11,000 patients in total. And this uh, prospective meta-analysis showed that either uh, tocilizumab or cerilumab were superior to usual care in patients with COVID-19. This also shows another strength of the prospective meta-analysis, the data showing benefit derived from recovery and remand cap Primarily, these are the largest of the trials that were included. And in fact, early in the pandemic, several small trials with very imprecise uh, estimates were actually stopped for futility. So the capacity to pool data at a large scale 
tens of thousands of patients that they were able to identify a striking treatment in effect for a drug that is available and further to show that this is a class effect and not the effect of any one particular IL-6 receptor antagonist. Another uh, innovation uh, that has really gained uh, traction during the pandemic has been the preprint uh, server, the publishing of results before they've undergone peer review. Despite the potential uh, for misinterpretation of trials and, and the possibility that either fraudulent or poorly done trials may be posted, I think this has been a significant step forward and it's emblematic of the willingness of the world to share information at the time of global need. So just to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic has fundamentally changed our lives, but it's also changing our professional lives. It is opening us up to new trial designs, and particularly platform trials and adaptive designs. It is underlying the extraordinary power associated with international collaboration, but also the willingness of a global community to collaborate. Critical care is emerging as one of the key elements of a public health response, and at the WHO level, uh, intensivists make up a substantial part of those who are responding to uh, COVID-19. And finally, I think we are increasingly seeing something that we have intuitively known for time, for some time, which is that the best clinical care comes when research is embedded into the provision of that clinical care. So it's hard to know where we'll be six months from now, a year from now, even two months from now. But I think it's fair to say that uh, COVID-19 is opening a door to us uh, that is going to continue to yield some really transformative uh, insights in the months, years, uh, and even decades ahead of us. Thanks again for your attention this morning and for the invitation to be a part of your meeting. Thank you very much, uh, John. That was uh, really excellent and uh, very much uh, interesting uh, topic that you have covered different uh, aspects of the 